Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. First off, I just want to say a huge thank you for all the positive feedback I got about the first episode. I wasn't really too sure what to expect, um, but this has been really encouraging. Uh, Originally, I only planned to do about one episode a month, but because of the great response I got, I am going to be ramping that up to two regular episodes a month. So starting now, there will be one episode released on the 11th, and one on the 25th of each month. Uh, So thank you so much for your continued support. I'm glad to hear you're enjoying the podcast so far. Your interest and time spent listening really means a lot. Uh, If you'd like to support me and the podcast further, you can do that by leaving a five-star rating and written review wherever you're listening right now. It really does help with the algorithm, uh, which plays a big part in how this podcast could grow. Uh, If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on my Facebook page, Twitter, or Instagram just by searching my name, Jonathan Vautour, or you can email me directly at therealjohnstunes at gmail.com, all lowercase, all one word. Uh, Please don't be shy. I'd love to hear from you. And last but not least, I just want to take this quick opportunity to plug a show I have coming up on September 7th with my friend touring from Kamloops, BC, Kyle Cavanaugh. Uh, The show is at Leanne's Pub in Millet, Alberta, so that's just about uh, 35 minutes ish south of Edmonton Uh, it's a free show so there's no cover charge uh, just drinks and good times good food Uh, I've played there before Leanne's is a great little place uh, and it's always a party crowd Um, doors open at 8 p.m. show starts at 9 Uh, it is a bar so 18 plus sorry kids maybe next time All right, today's very special guest is Logan Cunningham. Logan is a top-tier drummer heavily involved here in the local Edmonton music scene. He currently plays in three, that's right, three ongoing bands, not even including mine, which he does do from time to time, Uh, Hungry Hollow, Lucid Ending, and Errol Quinn Band. We discussed everything ranging from time management and what it's like to play in so many different groups to the different venues local to Edmonton and the unfortunate turnover the local scene has seen with some of those venues recently and how personal, political, or sometimes just contrary views on any given topic and a willingness to discuss them openly can affect your musical career. Uh, Please give it up for my good friend, Logan Cunningham. Okay, Logan, brother, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. Where you been? What you you been doing? Lately? Yeah, lately. Jamming a lot and playing in three bands takes up a lot of my time. Yeah, you d- you do play in a lot of different and, and not even just those three bands. Like you play a lot of like one of projects too. Hey, like yeah, little, yeah. little bits of things here. Yeah. What's like the YouTube thing that you do? What's what's that about? Uh, well, we started doing that and we kind of ended up putting that down. That didn't really. Oh, so it's not kind of going anywhere anymore. No, okay. I mean we because basically what happened with, with that was I was one of the guys that I'm working with now, Errol Quinn. He uh, he was in a different band called Crash to Eden. So at the time, that was his main focus. Mm-hmm. And so I had really wanted to work with him for a long time. He's he's just a really cool guy. And he's a really good musician in general. Sure. And um, the, o- the only way that that was really feasible because of our uh, time constraints and our schedule lineups was to record different parts separately in a studio and videotape everything. And we were planning on making a YouTube cover channel like that. And then... Mm-hmm. His band kind of ended up fizzling out, and now we're in a band together. So right, so it was originally just kind of like a um, like a publicity was, stunt type. Yeah, it was going to be just a side project because we were both in separate bands and we didn't have the time schedules to play in a band together. And then right, right, his band. Fizzled but you just out. you just really wanted to work with him. Was that the Spe- idea? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, him and then Cam was going to be involved too. But right, right. And and was, so was the original because I think you kind of mentioned to me before the original idea was kind of like to do it live off the floor, right? Yeah, I mean, we had tossed around a couple different ideas. Live off the floor was the easiest because we could just kind of do it all in one go. And you guys were all like A-list musicians too, so. Eh, it depends on your definition of A-list. But um, I would say like like the pros and cons would be like for, for live off the floor, everybody has to be there all at once. And you have to be able to rehearse and you have yep. to be able to, you know, It's a much bigger off. time investment in the pr- in the pre like the prep the prep work sorry prep work and like when it comes time to actually film and do it everybody's schedules all need to line up whereas right. if we were just doing it in a studio setting yeah we could just videotape everybody's tracking right and just use the use the takes that were good and then compile everything with the backing track behind right right yeah well and that's that's a like 
for me, like as somebody who, because like when I started out, I always wanted to play in a band, right? I wanted yeah. to play in a rock band, and I eventually kind of, you know, I lived that dream a little bit, and it yeah. was like, eh, it's 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 fun. Like I really like it. Mm-hmm. I like the music and everything. My challenge was is was always that you can't get, or and I mean, there's it's 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 a magic recipe, um, but it's it's really tough to get however many people, four or five people, however many people in your band, yeah. all on the same page, all in the same room as yeah. often as needed yeah and then to get them on the same level of commitment too like that's commitment so and then and then musicality just being able to perform at the same level where it's, you know some people aren't you know maybe holding other people back things yeah. like that where it's like oh, i swear just, i swear like that's as far as bands go like because because it's already so difficult to make it in music in oh, general yeah. And this is add, so much. It's so easy to get content out there nowadays. Yeah, well, I mean, but it's but like yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing to make it in the music business. But then you add an, another level on top of that. Like we have to, everyone's got to get along. Everyone's got to work together. Yeah. Well. Everyone's got to have the same vision. They're got to be as committed. And it's like that's just one whole another universe of difficulties. Yeah, and it's just the Goldilocks zone of you know. I swear, like if a band can make that work. Now they can actually begin taking on the the ch- general challenges of the music industry. Oh, for just, sure. You know, so that's, that's yeah, not tough. just interpersonal challenges within the band. Yeah, it, it's a tough yeah. it's a tough element, right? I uh, yeah, I don't I I so that's kind of why I got away, like because I, I really enjoyed it. I was writing music for it and everything like that, and it never really we kind of fizzled. We never you know uh, went anywhere with it. We recorded a bunch of stuff that mm-hmm. I still have on my laptop and never yeah. released it, kind of thing. And um, but yeah, the problem was was that there was one or one or two members well there was particularly one member you know who you are <laughs> i'm not gonna throw you under the bus don't worry there's but always one there's always one there's one member who is really difficult like they wouldn't show up to practice some of this or they'd show up hours late kind of thing and, and there's always one right and uh like they were they were a great player like they were really they had the natural talent but they did not invest the the time to develop the skill yeah and and when they had the time i'm trying to be really careful because i don't want to like out this person oh of course but but um if if they had like because when they you could tell when when they put in the time to actually on their own in their own space yeah to do it it was a big difference come come oh 100 it was like oh you actually have parts to play now you know what i mean like not just like playing the same chords i am right yeah um and yeah so it was and, and, it, and it got way better uh, towards the end, except that they didn't have their own transportation and this and that. And it was really, uh, and, and none of us really wanted to go as a three piece or anything. Like it was just, it was one of those things, right? Yeah. So that all being said, like I, I totally see the the value. Having of, a space to be able to practice as a band is a big thing. Oh, too. that's hard. Like, that is hard, especially with yeah. like live drums. Like being a drummer is like that's the most difficult thing I found, and it's a huge reason why I play in as many different things as I play in. Yeah, I live in an apartment where we're recording right now. Yes. Yeah. You can tell. There's not a lot. I cannot play my drums here. Yeah. I could get an electric kit if I really wanted to. And you, even that, you could probably only play certain times of the day. Yeah, I mean, like, our soundproofing is okay, but I have no idea how the people below us would feel about yeah, thumping I, on the I, ground constantly from kick drum pedals. But and, and that's why, like, the... I mean, that's where the the sort of cliche comes from where, where all the band is practicing in the drummer's garage, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not because it's not because the drummer always has, it's just because he doesn't want to move his kit. All yeah, the time, exactly. Right? And so. then you, yeah, you can have access to it all the time. Like that's the ideal situation for any drummer. I think yep. is to either, either have more than one kit where you can be at home and you can practice on your own and then not have to pack it up and drag it somewhere right. or have the practice you just space jam your wherever. Space. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's, one of those two situations. If you can afford to have a second kit, it's nice. Like, I have two kits now, but, I mean, I wish I didn't have to spend money on a second kit, but... Right. With an apartment, I don't really have much choice unless I want to haul... It's It sucks for setting up, too, because it's a time thing. You know, spend an hour, 40 minutes setting up a kit, mm-hmm. tweaking it, and then it's never right. Mm-hmm. Like, sometimes I'll set my kit up if, if it's a place where my kit's going to stay... And sometimes it'll take me weeks of tweaking, like every jam, oh, this needs to be lowered or this needs to be right. raised. When I do a full breakdown and set it back up. Yeah. That's the challenge of drummers, man. And like uh, other band members, I don't think really quite get the scope of what goes into playing drums. Like, um, I, and I've met drummers and I've met other musicians too, like that kind of, I've, I've met, let me, let me put it this way. I've met drummers who talk about drumming, like it's not a real instrument. Yeah. Like, and, and it, it 
it's definitely a more primal instrument. And that's the exact word he used to describe it to me. Um, was this more primal instrument? There's, you know, you, you play what you play. And he, I mean, this is a guy who doesn't even like fills. He doesn't like solos. He hates, he wants to play as minimal as possible. He just wants to be the backbone of the song. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's something respectable about that. Like, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying like, there's a lot more respect. Like vocalists, for example, what do you have to bring when you set up? Yeah, exactly. Most of them don't even own a microphone. You no, know what I mean? Like, yeah. what, what is this, right? Yeah, exactly. Guitarists, I mean, we have minimal equipment, but we still, a lot of us still have, you know, giant cabs and, yeah. um, or, or multiple guitars, depending on the show or set we're playing. Yeah. Um, pedals. Kind of, yeah. And, and tune, yeah, pedals and, and cables and stuff to go along yeah. with that. Bass players, giant cabs, et cetera. Bass players usually have a smaller rig than guitarists, but not always. It depends. It depends. I've, I've, I've played with my fair share of bass players who own a fridge yeah yeah that's true like that's eight, true eight that's by true. what six yeah and for, and for those of you out there those of you bass players who own a fridge just get some rack gear just no, it <laughs> just get rack gear just do it okay it's gonna rack be, gear and a thumper rack gear and a thumper exactly exactly you don't need you don't need all this yeah it's it's unnecessary it's unnecessary i saw a picture the other day on as Facebook. long as the pa can move the amount of air because that's the well, last thing you yeah. don't want the bass getting but buried. this is the thing you're either playing a giant venue where the PA can handle that yeah. itself, or you're playing a small venue where you're way overkill. Yeah, where you're, one of the two. Yeah, exactly. Where your amp is more than enough. I saw I saw a picture on uh, Facebook the other day. I can't remember who posted it, but it was basically, it was like a rear view from behind the stage of this giant festival. Like oh you, yeah. I don't know what it was or which festival it was or whatever. And you can see, so this guitarist had stacks and stacks and stacks. None of them were plugged in, were they? Oh, dude, they, they were just they were just straight up just the cabs there was no there wasn't even any there was nothing in them there were just the boxes there was no there was no speakers nothing it was just straight up it was just showmanship it was of just course. A, it was hilarious i was like oh that's my. metal yeah exactly exactly <sighs> all the people in the audience that think it's awesome they have, they have it's nothing's coming yeah, from those cabs no not a single thing there was just no. bo- empty boxes no everything's speakers. coming out of the the pa system yeah it was, and maybe there was one somewhere yeah, one not one likely is, yeah not likely well that, like that's the whole point of getting on like in ears and stuff anyway right is to decrease your your stage sound yeah and then just have you know so when you're playing those giant shows that's what i'm trying to say so it just seems overkill like it's cool gear is cool don't get me wrong i just uh functionality wise who wants to haul all that shit around all yeah the time? no those fridges suck they're worse going downstairs. I've heard oh. too many horror stories of people trying to take yeah, them downstairs. Throwing out your themselves. back or you get crushed or yeah. Well, people try and like let them drag, let the fridge drag them down the stairs. Like they'll have it really? in front of them okay. and like walk forward. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you like, you lose your grip and that thing will drag you it'll throw straight you. down those stairs. Oh yeah. Like, it'll throw gone. you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. That's like a and it's, hundred pound, hundred and twenty pound cab. I mean, it's delicate stuff too, right? Like yeah. it's not like it's it's really heavy cab, but it, at the same time, if it, you'd expect something bulky to not be so delicate, but you don't want to be breaking throwing that around. No, like, you wouldn't. I mean, they have the rails on the back of the Ampeg ones that are okay for like dragging them on stairs, but you don't want to drop it down the stairs. No, 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 hundred percent not. That's yeah, that's brutal. Um. So okay. So back to your back to this youtube project you guys were doing it just i thought i just thought it was really interesting when you were telling me about it before like it kind of reminded me of there was for a short period of time there was this website that i liked to play around on i think it was called oh, off the top of my head i think it was like band mix or something like that basically mm-hmm. it was like a video musician website where you would you would go on there and you could record yourself playing covering a song or playing original song or whatever and then other people you could open it to collaboration so other people could record themselves playing to what you're playing oh that's cool yeah it was a lot and um i i don't like i really had a lot of fun for the short period of time that i was messing around on it but what i what happened ultimately was that the site kind of i think it over like it tried to monetize itself directly so it costed money to start doing anything real yeah and it was like really frustrating. Yeah, like, that's that's annoying. Yeah, like, rather than just push ads. On I would have preferred honestly. ads. I would have as much as watch this for ten seconds. Yeah, I, I would have preferred that. I would have preferred that. <laughs> um, but it was it was a lot of fun that you could just you know go on and record. We did covers. We we did uh, I think we did like Slow Cheetah by um, Red Hot Chili Peppers oh, and yeah. stuff and things like that. Like people and it wasn't just like people with like there were some people with like iPhone and webcams and stuff. But it was it was a lot of people with professional like recording gear and stuff. So yeah. It was a lot of a lot of fun, but it really, I really reminded me of that, and so I just thought it was pretty cool. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so that project's kind of fizzled; it's not going anymore, hey? Yeah, no, I mean, 
it kind of lives on through Ken a little bit. Ken has recently, uh, he's the lead guitar player that plays with me with uh, Errol Quinn. Right. And uh, he actually has recently started a company called Live Tone Productions. Okay. And he's basically kind of doing the same thing. Live off live off the floor recordings for bands. Right, so right, bands right, right. can just go in. He's got GoPro set up and he does a professional live off the floor studio hmm. studio recording. I think you've seen a couple of our videos. I think I've seen a couple clips, yeah. 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 Um yeah, he does those out of there and he's uh he's actually been semi mentored by Brad Smith from Velveteen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um he's given him quite a bit of advice and it seems to be uh helping him quite a bit. So Cool. The sound quality's definitely there. Nice. Just needs yes. to get away from those GoPros. Yeah, I mean the GoPros are okay. I mean they're okay in the short run. I don't know if it's just because they're older, but you well, you know the um, GoPros are a little weird. Like they tend to. I mean, my, it could be the lighting. I'm not sure. But I was like, gonna say that it's their aperture though is super, super, super small. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what what that means for those of you that aren't super into the video or photographer world is basically that the. Um, there's a little iris around the lens that closes and it, with the bigger aperture you have, the more light it lets in, but then the more depth of field you have. So, uh, a really small aperture is good if you want to take like a big background picture and get all the detail of many different objects, but it's a lot harder to get a well lit picture. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's, that's the challenge with the GoPro is it's designed to kind of catch everything because yeah, you a, can't like set it up and like, you know, it's it, most, the old ones didn't even have screens. Right. So you just had to point and yeah, it's totally like fish eyed. So it, it, I don't know. You I think should, it should be able to edit that out too though. Like it shouldn't, you should be able to take the fish eye effect out. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just the, the angle, the lens is a wide angle lens. So yeah, like you were saying, it's, de it's designed to get the most in the photo Yeah, because I mean, a lot of the, purposes for gopros or for you know, sports athletes or, yeah, yeah extreme sports stuff like well that, i you so. know what i i'll say this though in in defense of gopro i i own a gopro for sure oh, yeah. and i've used it for music stuff before mm -hmm. what, what it's really 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 good for you stick that sucker on the end of your guitar yeah or mount it on your mic stand or something on your yeah that's right I, that's right yeah at the it was the hungry hollow release yeah, wasn't it that was tell us world of science yeah you had that so. mounted on your chest playing drums it was yeah. kind of a cool picture yeah. yeah i'm excited to get that footage back i still haven't oh yeah, is yeah. It, who has it? Is that ian has it ken has it ken has it yeah okay. i have to there's something weird with this computer it won't let him won't let him get it off the computer the storage has too much there's too much storage used up on his hmm. on his imac for him to actually be able to copy it and move it so could he not just like lend you the 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 SD card or something? Or? Well, it's not on the SD card anymore. He moved. Oh, so it's on the computer. Yeah, and the computer won't let him pull it off <sighs> because the storage is too full. So he has to like move a bunch of stuff off this computer into the cloud or something. To ah, something smells fishy. Yeah, it's really annoying. That's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. He showed oh. me. He like showed me the open file on his computer, and he tried copying it. And it said. No, not enough storage because it has to make a clone basically yes so the copy, so copy has, that's how copy paste yeah so it has to double the file size so now you just took up twice as much storage as that file was taking up in your computer just to be able to copy it so right. you can put it somewhere you just need to delete some old shit take some, of the, take some of his take some of his favorite porn out of there or whatever, yeah exactly like, he's gonna have to, on. he's gonna have to wipe the slate yeah just a little bit gotta lose some of that some of that uh, you know just get lose a, some of the least favorite yeah, porn get a digital mr clean magic eraser yeah <laughs> <laughs> is that or like what's that like mcafee mcafee oh no. i hate those things all oh, those security oh they're terrible they slow your computer down so much and they feel are like you sure are you sure it's mcafee are you sure it's not just the porn yeah uh, <laughs> no comment both. no comment no comment <laughs> yeah so um anyway so what, where have you guys been actually you know what actually hold on let's go back a little bit what's for everybody here what are the main bands? What are the projects you're in right now? Because I um, I didn't realize that that YouTube thing was not yeah it, going anymore. It's, yeah, it doesn't really exist, and that's just simply because like there, there's still footage out there. Like you can find it on YouTube and stuff, right? Some no. of it. No, no, it never got we released. Never, we never even ended up filming. Oh, yeah, okay. well, we, that sucks. We we tracked drums, and that was it. I I must be mistaken because the videos I saw then that's something those else. Those are those are all live tone. That's all. Oh, okay, that's Ken. Yeah, that's oh, all I see. Ken. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, that's a much clearer. Okay, I understand now. I, I <laughs> thought that some of that, like I knew I knew that, but I thought that some of that was the original stuff that. You yeah, the had. um, well, Vaseline actually, the first first live off the floor Ken ever did was with me, Quinn, uh, Josh, and Ken. 
And that song was actually originally part of our original covers we were going to do for the YouTube. And that's why we picked okay. it is because we all already knew it. Oh, like everybody actually okay. like Ken, everybody had actually gone through the trouble of learning. And then it was just a matter of everybody, everybody scheduling into track. And then we were going to film music video style after. Right. And we tracked drums for everything all in one day. And nothing, nothing else happened. Yeah. Oh, you were so much more committed than everybody else. I guess so. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah. That sucks. That I sucks. mean, but now, now, uh, because that fizzled out, Quinn and I have had the opportunity to play on the bigger, together. better things, bigger, better. Yeah. Things. It's, yeah. it's, it's working out pretty good so far. I mean, everybody gets along really well and, uh, I've seen the videos. They look great. Yeah. Everybody's yep. musical tastes are fairly aligned. And I mean, Quinn, everybody's just, a pretty pretty high, highly skilled and experienced musicians which is really nice to have when everybody is on the same page you know yeah um so that's that's errol quinn band and then uh, i also play with two other groups uh hungry hollow which i had a history with them and then kind of took a little break from it to pursue some other projects and then just recently this past this past winter i started jamming with them again and i played their cd release at yep. tell us world of science yeah that was a great just show recently in june yeah. yeah the i mean the the display the visuals and everything were amazing i mean for me on stage the audio left something to be desired but that's just because it was so loud based yep. on the way that like well, we all should I'll have say had, it again you guys should have been on in-ears yeah, that's exactly yeah. what i was just gonna say we should have we should have had in-ears i mean the, the the only thing that in-ears wouldn't have stopped is all the video footage i have there's so much like echo on everything right there's like almost every time you hear me hit a snare or anything you hear two of it yeah because of where anywhere you're filming unless you're filming like right in front of my face because the room is is, is you know a big sphere yep it just sound bounces all over the place so for, so some people may not know quite what we're talking about but you can go on youtube and you can look this up i think what do you search just like hungry hollows CD release yeah um None of it's actually on YouTube. Oh, okay. Um, all the clips that I have released right now are on, on my. Facebook? Uh, they're on my personal Instagram. Oh, okay. So plug that. Um, my personal Instagram for my drum channel is uh, Logan Maxwell underscore Drums. Right. Um, so I have basically that. I have a compilation. My whole goal with that is to just kind of put little bits and pieces of everything I'm involved with. Yep. Um, just to try and keep track of it, keep a compilation, you know. Right. So you can Anyways. go. So you can go to Instagram. You can check out those clips, and you'll see in the clips that it's kind of like the whole room is a giant dome, um, and it's like a laser light show all over the ceiling and stuff, and um, playing a show in the middle of that. It's, it's really cool. It was a really neat idea. It's, think like Pink Floyd laser light show, but yeah, a yeah, little was, more advanced. Almost. The Ziegler Star Dome at uh, Telus World of Science. It was a pretty unique show. We kind of got that hook up. I mean, partially because. Uh, Hungry Hollow has kind of been been around for a little while. I mean, that was their first album release they've done in the area. Mm -hmm. um, they have like thirteen hundred likes or something on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but uh, that and Julie, the uh, co front person, front woman, she um, she actually works there. So right. She a little she bit had, in the, in the back yeah, door. Kinda. A little bit. I mean, any band can book there. It just made it a lot easier to coordinate because she was employed there. Yeah. So like she could just ask questions. All so they're the actually time they're and, actually open to taking. As um, far as I know, she that's what she told me is that any band can contact their pe the people that are in charge of booking there. Right. And it's it's just a matter of it being like a rental. Right. right. It's not. Right. It's not like. It's like, to an, set it's up like a, an old school music venue. Yeah. Well, because yeah, it's a it. venue that they have to actually set up the event to serve the alcohol and everything there. Because they're not. They don't run when there's nothing going on. No. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's not like where you go to the station downtown where it's a bar that serves food that people are going to every day. Right. Oh, we got some dogs in the background. I guess it's it's really hot out today, so we just kind of have the door open, and so from time to time you might hear the cat or the dog walk through the room, but that's cool. That's cool. Logan's a big pet guy. He loves his puppy. I do. You'll she's, see that on his Instagram, I'm sure, at some point here. She's the uh, she's definitely the greatest dog I think I've ever met in my life. There you go. Yeah. I don't think there's a better one. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's two. What's the third project? Uh, the third in? one is uh, Lucid Ending. I actually have that right there too. Oh, very cool. And yeah, I actually took that photo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a old Lincoln that uh, we recently had a group camping. Trip. Can they see that on your Instagram as well? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't posted that yet, but I probably should because it's kind of cool. Okay, um, is that's is where it's not like classified information or anything. No, no, no. It's, no. A it's new, just new... A, it's just a photo I okay. took. It was pretty cool. Looked like a. 
cool background. But mm-hmm. um, no, Lucid Ending, um, last, I think it was last summer, I was looking for, you know, a rock project to be able to play on my full kit because me and, me and you were, were playing quite a bit yep. last year. But no offense, I, I like playing on a, on a full drum set. So I couldn't, I, I know I can handle more than one project. So being able to, to do that as well as being able to play on a drum set was something I really wanted to do. So right. I kind of just sought them out. I found them on, uh, they actually threw up an ad on Kijiji and they seem to have a decent following built up. Uh, Steve Mahoney, the rhythm guitar player and one of the uh, founders of the band, I guess you could say, he uh, he's a marketing whiz of sorts, and he's actually uh, he actually worked in in California for a couple of years under um, uh, who was it DJ Khaled. Oh really? Yeah, he actually like talked we to the them best several times. Music. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, he actually, yeah, he worked with him for a couple of years in his studio in Cali. And then, uh, yeah, he, he's uh, actually also known for doing a song that's on uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. Okay, so some he, Bioware uh, stuff. Yeah, he's yeah. a um, more of an electronic sort of producer as far as... Right. Uh, like lo-fi pro- bedroom stuff? Yeah, as yeah, far yeah. as his producer stuff goes, it's mm-hmm. more electronic music and like hip-hop beats and stuff. He mm-hmm. actually worked with a guy called Ace Hood who worked under DJ Khaled. Hmm. He did like all his beats for I think one or two albums, mm-hmm. um, but he's also running a company right now called FreeBeats.io. He has a Instagram and website where he basically gives out free at free free background beats for hip hop music for any aspiring hip hop artists that want backing tracks for right. them. So pretend the music. Yeah. <laughs> I was, um, I'm just gotta, I just got to put that in there. He gets, uh, the... he, he, he gets Google ad revenue off of it. Basically. No, I'm just busting balls. I, I'm not a, I am not a hip hop. I mean, he's, fan. he's a pretty good market strategist. He does a lot of that too. As far as his, uh, his employment goes, he does a lot of marketing strategies for online for companies and stuff like that. Right. He's pretty, he's pretty good with that stuff. He, uh, his whole, his whole theory behind it is that he gets the ad revenue from Google for running ads on the website. Yeah. And then he also, in order to download, you have to follow his social media. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen that. That's like a tone den thing. Hey, the whole, I've seen yeah. those those um, social captures. Those are cool. Yeah. Uh, they've never particularly worked for me personally, but that's, I mean, maybe I'm doing them wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe it's like, depend really depends on the type of people. Yeah, to, I mean, like, the type of music, like, I mean, I think rap is probably the ideal thing for that because it's, yeah. rap is almost exclusively a solo thing, right? Like, yeah, so in all a lot it of takes ways. is one yeah. person and a backing track for them to really create a song. I mean, you can add extra stuff to it, yeah. but for it to be a song, like, you don't really need much more than That's, that. Th- this is music. true. This is true. It's, it's, it's very much the, um, the do it yourself, very, yeah, it's, it's I the mean, definition of the easiest. I wouldn't say it's easy per se to well, actually I would. like i would well the, the the make the 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 putting everything together is is easy i don't know if the the lyric writing and the poetry aspect of it i would consider easy i mean i'm not a vocalist the, fair enough so fair that's enough. that's yeah. it's not easy for me yeah I'll, probably I'll, for you you're I'll, a lyricist, I'll crap on rappers so. all day long yeah you're a lyricist you can, you can do whatever you want yeah that's fine. i can't fucking write vocals so i'm not gonna shit on rap to all you rappers out there you should probably pick up an instrument if you're gonna call yourself an artist or a musician anybody can write shitty poetry and it's going to be just as shitty as yours and it's whatever. So we're moving on. Huh. <laughs> so wait, wait, what kind of music? So go quickly name those three groups again. There's uh, Lucid Ending, yeah. Hungry Hollow yeah. and Errol Quinn Band. Okay. And what um, kind of, what, what would you say they prospectively fit into genre wise? Like what kind of music are they? I would say Hungry Hollow is, is uh, all they're Hungry Hollow and Lucid Ending are probably the most similar. Okay. Um, Hungry Hollow is, they're both alternative rock, I would say, but Hungry Hollow is a little more. There's all, there's a female vocal there too, so that kind of adds a different element. Mm-hmm. But they're more a little brighter sound. They're a little, yeah. I mean, they're both '90s influenced, but in different ways. Um, Hungry Hollow is more the southern sort of Matchbox Twenty, right? Sort of even almost almost like like pulling over into like '90s country, sure, almost in that era. Um, Lucid Ending is more like uh, Bush, Red Hot Chili Peppers influence, sure, sure. sort of that mid to late '90s feel. Okay. Um, and then Errol Quinn Band is a mix of straight up uh, early '90s grunge music, with uh, all the way up to like uh, early to mid 2000s hard rock and like post grunge stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so that would either be... like Three Days yeah. Grey, Stained, right. 
And then like your grud- typical grunge bands, you know, Alice in Chains, Stone Temple Pilots, gotcha. Soundgarden. Gotcha. Okay, so if that's if that's your if that fits your cup of tea, then go check those bands out. Uh, Logan plays in all of them, and um, <laughs> I've seen most of that. I've seen two of the three live. I haven't yeah, seen Arrow. Haven't seen Arrow Quinn is new still, right? Like Arrow Quinn's the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you saw Lutz ending at uh, Denison Hall. I did. Yeah. You did. I did. That was with yeah. our old bass player. Yeah. 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 So there are, there are great projects. Go check them out. Um, I kind of wanted to ask you, where do you guys typically? I mean, because you play in so many different projects. I mean, yeah. those three are the kind of the main ones. And then I know you play with me occasionally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you play in other, I'm sure you've played other little one of things here and there and that yeah, kind of stuff. I mean, more the... Or studio all, work and stuff like that too, whatever. Um, I mean, most of that sort of stuff that, that I do is, uh, most of it's like open jams and stuff. Just right. collaborating and, and being around other musicians is always fun. Right. So being, like, you're fairly, that keeps you fairly busy, I know. Like, you're... You're playing, you're usually jamming a couple times a week, right? Yeah, it's usually like, well, just recently, um, the front man for Hungry Hollow, Ian Dick. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can't not laugh. I'm sorry, Ian. You can't I didn't not do it. laugh. You can't not laugh. I, I nicked the, from day one, as soon as I met him, I found out he drives a Dodge Grand Caravan and immediately I nicknamed it the Dick Mobile. Oh, that's, that's immediately. Cool. Like, okay. it was like day two. Day two. Um, so. No, I can't remember where I was going. Uh, I, oh, I was asking you how. So, uh, okay, let me reframe my question because I kind of I didn't quite ask the question, but I, I I was framing the question. So I said, I know you're fairly busy. I know you play in oh, yeah. these different projects and stuff. Um, I I was gonna ask first, how many shows do you get? Do you figure you play? You know, in in a month or a year or whatever. Like how how regularly are you? Like because you jam, but how 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 busy are you show wise um, personally like between these all these different groups well the last six months have been probably like the most busiest six months musically i've ever had in my life and that's probably largely due to the fact that everybody's got new material coming out in all those different um, projects eh? that and people are just there people are supporting material like even with you like we did a full week in april yep we did um We've just done lots of local shows, like local yep. and like slightly far away, but um, yeah, within an hour or two yeah. in the city, generally. Yeah, so like or, I mean, we, me, and you have played probably what ten, twelve shows this year, at least. Oh, I'm pretty sure we probably more double than that. that. Probably closer. Uh, I know to 20. G. I know G has an actual count on his phone. I could ask him, or I could look in the show schedule. But he said something like, "Last time I talked to him, I think he said it was like twenty or some shows." Yeah, twenty or thirty shows. Yeah, me and him are but, probably pretty even because there's a lot of local shows that me and you played. That's two I was gonna us. say because me and him did the Rise Up tour together, yeah. and you weren't there for that. But yeah, you and me have done a couple of like small one of like private yeah, shows just, and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah, for sure. So yeah, that, that's my point. Is you're so you're pretty busy, and so I guess I wanted to ask. In being that way, how does that like? Do you do you notice? Yeah, like I guess. You, okay, so you've been through a lot of different venues doing that. Oh yeah. Um, do you notice some of like like a, a lot of the venues kind of come and go in this city? Like, what's how do you feel about how the venues are? What's the state of them? Do you feel like they're dying? Do you feel like they like they exist for a couple of years and then they die and another one takes its place? Like, how does that? Because because I've kind of noticed that. Well, I just wanted to, you know. I mean, I kind of, I kind of caught the tail end out of, of a couple venues that that were going for a little while, so I don't really have a whole bunch of history on the ones that have shut down. Um, I mean, the only one that I was that I that's really been popular that's you know shut down um, was the Needle Tavern started, and then they yes. had that whole sexual assault thing, and yep. then they kind of came, they they left, and then they are under new ownership as the station now. So I mean. You can kind of consider that a shutdown. I mean, obviously, yeah. there's a cause and effect there. Right. It's pretty obvious what happened. Well, and there. I mean, off the top um, of my head, like that's one. Yeah. And um, well, the the pawn shop, uh, I've I've played there a couple times. Well, they weren't even the pawn shop. They were. They, it was the forge. Well, it was the pawn shop before. That's. Yeah. What I mean, like I, I played at the pawn shop when it was the pawn shop. Right. At least twice, because I've been I've been playing bar shows in Edmonton since I was 18. So like basically right out of high school, I got into a band called match breaker back in 2012 like i think it was uh october or november or something and by beginning of 2013 we were already playing shows so like my first gig ever was at bricks doesn't exist anymore it doesn't nope 
Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I, I played there. Yeah, Bricks yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Ha. Huh. Yeah, they are now a like a like a they're pushing their food more. Okay. They're more of a they're, so more like a they're, restaurant. They're more like a tap house sort uh, of deal. Uh, okay. But they okay. do have some live music there occasionally, but they're not a venue. The stage Are they still called Bricks? No. Okay. They're called River City something. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Um for those of you that don't know that that was that's right underneath the Starlight Room, which is kind of a nationally recognized venue for bigger touring bands they it's they have two there's the starlight room which is the bigger i think they have two stages there now don't they they have temple now too oh do they okay yeah so temple is kind of in the area between the staircase where you go up to starlight room so there's three venues there now it's kind of three the the one underneath is more just for like um open jams and like smaller things like i don't think anybody actually like has a show show there where they're like inviting people to come to it. You know right. what I mean? Okay. I don't think that's what their, their, their main goal is anyways. I think most of the time the shows they have are more just open jams and lighter, oh. smaller things. Okay. Cause the big stage they used to have at bricks that, you know what stage I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. That one's completely gone as oh, far as okay. I know. Yeah. See, and that's to me, that's crazy to hear. Like, cause I played, I played at bricks way back. Like, um, that's almost everybody's ago. first gig like yeah. as far as i i knew like a lot of, that was like a rite of passage man, the to guy play who bricks. the guy who booked that one too screwed me like i didn't get paid or anything really that was oh yeah yeah was that art sabo no i don't want to name drop him I mean, it, it wasn't that guy it was uh i'll tell you later i'll hmm. tell you later uh you know him though and we've had conversations about this i think you just forgot probably but i've definitely told you and, and yeah and i anyway uh, cool. but, but the funny story about that show, like I played there, uh, and I actually ran into one bad son cause they were playing the starlight room upstairs. Oh yeah. Yeah. And they came down and they watched my set and then they guest listed us, uh, me and the girl I was with at the time, uh, to their show. So we went up and they got to enjoy their show and yeah, they hung out with us. They're the cool guys. So yeah. One bad son's awesome. I actually, yeah, uh, great live, really I, great live show. I actually work with the drummer's cousin. He's my boss slash, oh, really? slash owner of our car star location. Yes. Oh, small, small world. Yeah. Small world. Yeah, that's hilarious yeah, it so, uh, it's to me it's just funny to hear about all these like yeah old slash new venues like this is yeah. what i'm trying to say is it seems like i don't know if they're actually dying or if they're constantly just not as profitable or successful as they want to be so they're trying to rebrand to change that all the time or like what and there's cases like uh, a good a good example is like um the forge like where it was the pawn shop and then it was uh, it kind of didn't last and then it was bought by uh, Dale and then it became the forge Yeah, and then they had a fire and yeah. that's, that's a whole it, the fire wasn't even them. The fire was actually like in another portion of the building that they like they shared. It was the same building, but it wasn't right. the forge location. They just got like where the fire started. Yes. They, they were suspecting it of arson, but the guy wasn't going after the forge. As far as I read, it was like another the other business, another business that shared the building with the forge. Right. But the forge ended they up getting, didn't, yeah, they didn't there's... have insurance or something. And yeah. Now they're not. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what's going on with that. Yeah. But... And I know they liquidated all their equipment and stuff. Like mm-hmm. I know um, Tyson, who I just had on the podcast, he bought a bunch of that gear and like, oh, wow. it was funny. We were at the, at his jam space the other day and he's like, Oh, this is one of those forge cables. <laughs> Smells like campfire. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty funny uh, but uh poor dale yeah poor dale oh, i think he's doing okay though i saw i saw a facebook post from the other day he's his uh his, he's having a grandkid or something like mm. that so it's good for him man i hope i hope he's i hope he uh things work out for him yeah i mean i hope if he gets another venue that they you know get insurance this time because it's, it's not good for them i mean it's certainly yeah. not good for the community when they lose you know such a vital yeah nobody vital lost harder than white, dale. Uh, well, nobody lost of harder course than not dale, obviously obviously he's the f- number one but as a as a you know prominent white ave location a lot of people really really like playing on white avenue because they don't like dealing with having to go downtown oh it's a tragedy for the scene definitely yeah there's no question about it i mean i just i just I'm, i don't want to come off as like insensitive to dale no I mean, for sure obviously that sucks for anybody yeah poor guy like i i felt real bad I, yeah i missed the venue though it was a great venue yeah um, it sucks worse that it, like the person who was arsoning wasn't even like going after their business but they were just like affected and such. what did any do you have any idea what happened to that other business like is it did that business get torched too or like i'm not sure because i mean basically i was only looking into it because of the forge so i wouldn't really right i don't really know what happened right but well and another another perfect example is the mercury room right yeah like uh that was a great venue it was and now um like now it's just i mean it's technically still a venue but they kind of just do private events there Hmm. and i'm not entirely sure 
I, I don't want to speak out of turn because I definitely know people that are on both sides of this, but more or less, it seems like that business was stolen from him by his landlord. That's what it seems like to me. I mean, I've heard that before that, you know, the name was actually registered to someone else and then the, the ownership. Yeah, but even if that's the case, like let's say there's a business that's open um, and then it closes down and then like 40 years later, somebody opens up a business and registers that business as their own and like there's no one to contest that that's their business now yeah. right like i can't start up you know i don't know jonathan vautour's house of pancakes and then go out of business and then 40 years later when there's no jonathan vautour pancakes you open up that same building and name it that and then register it under yourself and do all that mm-hmm. that's your business i can't come back i mean yeah. maybe i could but it's not it's not the same like we're talking about something that was no for sure know, yeah so yeah, I, yeah, there's some weird stuff going on with that situation for sure. But I hope I hope he's doing okay too. Like I haven't I haven't seen him or anything. But he was he was a another guy, one of those guys who is really um really involved in the scene and really really beneficial to the scene mm-hmm. here locally. And he brought in a lot of big um big acts that played a small, really good sounding room, mm-hmm. and uh, he treated everybody really well, as far as I know. And uh, it was yeah, I did uh, I did uh, a album release there. And yeah, it was a great. Yeah, I enjoyed venue. that venue when I played. It sounded there. really good there. Yeah, I played there like tw- two gigs in a row within like a month and a half of each other, and they were, they both were really good. And that was before the whole thing happened. Yeah, yeah. When, when Trevor was running it. Yeah. 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 It's Trevor. I'm not going to, I'm not butchering the name, right? It's Trevor. It's not Travis. It's I Trevor. No, I have no idea. 99% sure. <laughs> I apologize. And then there also was the, uh, the artery that used oh, to be yeah, in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. I played there. Yeah. When I was 18 or 19, um, my first ever band actually had our first ever CD release there. Okay. And uh, that was a really good small sounding venue too. Like, I can't remember who ran the sound there. I think it was a, some Grant Mack graduate. But when I played there, it sounded fantastic. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any complaints whatsoever. It was just, I mean, it probably wasn't. It was about the same size as Mercury. Maybe you're remembering it, was, it fondly kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? No, I think like, it was good. It was just, a, it was, wasn't giant. It was really nice, though. It was really, really nice. Well, sometimes the smaller rooms sound better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we weren't a super heavy band either, so it's not like the size was an issue. Yeah. It was just... Now I've played in some bigger rooms, like the like the rec room and stuff. So. Right. That's a great room. I liked the rec room. I, I really heard good. some conflicting opinions about... I think it depends who's running sound. Like, I understand yeah. that the general construction of the room maybe isn't... Like, it's because it's a lot of concrete, isn't optimal for yeah. shows. Yeah. But just the setup of the room is really nice. You can see everything. Yeah. The way the seating is set up and everything. Like it's it's really nice to be on that stage. Yeah. I haven't personally played there, but I ha- I've been to shows there. Yeah. I have friends that have played there, and again, sitting in the audience, I'm watching shows there. I'm like, wow, this is nice. Yeah. And and I can just imagine like having and the been stage on- is a good size too. It's not yes. like some little stage, like especially for a rock band. Like if it's you're the- a rock fan, you want to be able to move around on yes. stage. Yes. It's the you perfect know- it's the perfect size room where too where it's like the room is big. But it's not like so big that you couldn't. It doesn't look full. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Because the way this, the elevated seating and stuff yeah. is, and yeah, so it's it's a really good room for performance. Yeah, I don't, and I think sound it sounds quality better maybe, the fuller it is too, because the more people that are in there, the more sound. Yeah, that sound. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because we didn't have any issues when we played there. It sounded pretty good. Um, yeah, I didn't have any complaints at all. No, I uh, I've heard from a few sound techs that say it's kind of a pain to mix because of the concrete structure um but tyson. yeah tyson <laughs> tyson complains about everything He's like, bitch 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 but you know like i i at the same time though he, I, def- I defer to his expertise like he's he's right he's not wrong you know <laughs> um but yeah it's, you're not uh, wrong walter yeah exactly yeah. why asshole. are you booing me i'm right <laughs> uh but yeah he's uh he's he's for sure right it's i think it'd be a tough room to mix but uh it looks great and i think it would feel nice to perform on that stage for oh, sure. oh yeah so i'll have to get in there sometime here um so okay here's another question for you i've seen a couple of debates about this on facebook recently and i kind of shake my head because i i have real strong opinions about this and there are times there's like lots of room for exception and there's cases where it's totally acceptable and you know there's value in it whatever but what do you think about free gigs for exposure Free gigs, meaning the artist doesn't get paid. Yeah, like the like there's somebody like a venue or a promoter who's like, yeah, this is a, this is a free gig, but it's for exposure. You know, I can't pay you, but you get exposure. Well, I mean, who are you being exposed to? 
Wh- who's know. who's drawing these people that is the reason for not paying an artist? Like, who's actually... Like, if the venue can actually, you know, bring a decent amount of people and it's an artist that's just starting out and they can't sell tickets because they don't really have a following or... They well, hold on, hold on. Because this is, this is another thing that a lot of people probably don't realize, but I got to point out that a lot of newer artists for their first two or three shows tend to have the biggest draws. Well, then why would you even take a gig like That's that? That's what I'm trying to say. Like, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I can't book a show. I can't book a show or whatever. But in my experience, if you have a really green band or, or artist, all their friends and family are going to come out to that first two or three shows. Yeah, exactly. For sure they are. Yeah. Um, if you don't think so, you just... Again, I've been to a lot of these shows. Oh, yeah. And I booked a lot of green artists and a lot of, like, veteran artists. Yeah. And it's... There's no contest. Oh, yeah. Now, so... You're right. I think, like in my, my personal opinion about it, is there is pl- there are places where the exposure, quote exposure, is worth it. Um, just like a general show, I don't. No, see I would it. never. I well, the thing is, like, if you want to agree to that show to play that for no money, that's your prerogative. If you want to try and you know survive off of maybe selling merch and whatever else after. Go ahead, but the thing is, when you when too many people are doing that, it kind of dilutes the market and it kind of lowers the value of of your musicians because yeah, you have all these this basically free labor yeah. of people just going in and playing for free, and then they're like, okay, well, why don't you play for free? This is the why illegal, don't you play? the illegal immigrants That's of the musician community. What this <laughs> is. That's basically what it is. So like, I'm not saying don't do it if it's worth it for you. Go ahead, but. Just know that what you're getting into when you're doing it. And well, one of the arguments I hear for it is basically that you know you got to get experience and you want to you want to get on stage. And oh, for sure. I hear that. Like, there's a there is a certain amount of hours that you have to spend on stage, and once you hit that certain amount of hours, you've you've kind of like, okay, I know what I'm doing now. You know what yeah. I mean? I totally get that. Now, my argument is is that okay, but you don't need to do that for these free shows that are benefiting businesses that are not benefiting you. Like you're, yep. you're, you know, and, and also you can also do those at places like open mics. That's exactly what I was just going to say. Like that is my, that would be my first suggestion for those people. If you're right. just wanting to try and, you know, get the feel of playing on a stage. JT's in Mill Woods is a really good place. Yep. And Shakers is really good. We've yep. played there. What yep. was that other, we played at another one. Uh, Actually, no, that's not. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. But it, was like, it was the one off 75th Street. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we went there once. It was okay, but based on what I saw happening to the guy's drum set that I fortunately did not have to use due to the fact I was playing on a cajon, I'm glad I didn't have to play a drum set. <laughs> okay, yeah. I kinda, His, his I... tom arm was, like, not working, so right. the one rack tom was just, like, turning completely horizontally that's, while that's he was right. hitting it. Another one I frequent, um, as a side note, is Sherlock in West Edmonton Mall, uh, run by good friend Benjamin Williams. They have good food there. They have I've great been there. food there. I, I think I had pot pie there Tacos. or something before. Oh, yeah, and um, what was it I had the other day? It was super good. It was uh, Shepherd's Pie. Yes, I think that's what oh, I had, Shepherd's Pie. That was pie. so good. Yeah. So good. And, well, uh, I mean, it's called Sherlock's. They better f***ing have good Shepherd's Pie. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, eh? No kidding. <laughs> well, and, and it's a pretty... I'm not going to say it's busy, 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 busy every... Because they, they do them Wednesday nights. Yeah. Uh, but there's always a good mix of people, and Ben's always there. He's always happy. There's the there's the regulars yeah. there. Well, I mean, if you're getting and, experience on a stage, you don't necessarily want it to be crazy packed, because that's when your no. nerves start kicking. And it, it depends on what you're there. So I guess... So here's... Going back to what we were talking about before uh, before we started listing off open mics, <laughs> um, you know... we're because we, we say, you know, getting on stage time. So the question is, is I was here as well. What's the difference between playing an open mic and, and playing a free show for exposure? Well, I'll tell you the difference. The difference is, is you're networking with other musicians. Yeah. There are actually people there that are not there to see you, but you're being exposed to them. Yeah, so exactly. Actual exposure, a different kind of exposure, not necessarily fans, but other musicians, people that you could potentially book another show with. Yeah. Or, or collaborate with or whatever, right? You're getting yeah. involved in the scene. And uh, in addition to that, what I personally do at these open mics that I go to sometimes is I will test out new material there. So it's not, and you only play two or three songs. It's not like you're playing a 45 yeah, exactly. or an hour or two hours there set. For, yeah, exactly. Because if you're a train wreck, you don't want to train wreck through 40 minutes. No, you know, no. Train wrecking through nine minutes is a lot easier to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Or being able to just 
get off stage if you really want to because yeah. open mics there's no there's no you know expectation for no. you to continue if you feel no like... everybody everybody expects you to suck and yeah, that, that's exactly. not, that sounds terrible but i mean it's it, it's good because it's it's the the bar of expectations is low exactly. which means if you're decent while well, you've succeeded yeah you right? impress people yeah. yeah so i mean nobody expects you to be you know some incredible musician when you get up there but so like what i'll usually do is i'll i'll play usually you get two or three songs four or five if it's a really slow night and there's not a lot of people yeah. there um but i'll you know i'll usually play like one or two i'll play like one or two a grade songs yeah that you know to get uh, everybody kind of warmed up and then I'll, and then I'll try uh, a new song or test out some new material yeah. or, or a new cover I'm working on or yeah. whatever. Right. But that's, that's the value of an open mic. You don't get that when you're playing at a place that is expecting you to provide a product. Yeah. I mean, you might have a couple musicians show up just because it's a music venue, but yes. like the, the people aren't there to to play that aren't there to play. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Like, if you're not on the bill, you're not just... Musicians aren't going to show up unless they're there to see those people. Which is tragic on its own, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I agree. So that's that's where I line up on the whole free gig for exposure thing. I, I was arguing with some people on Facebook the other day about it, and I was kind of like... I definitely feel like it, like, waters down the value of musicians' time in Edmonton yes. when there's too much of it going on. Yes. It's it, okay here and there, but, like, my biggest piece of advice probably to most musicians would be have people watch you in your own jam space. Right. Whatever project you're doing, whether it's, you know, rap, hip-hop, rock, doesn't really matter. Have people come and watch you there before you go on a stage and embarrass yourself in front of, you know, 50 people you don't know. That's Because that's I've good. seen yeah. a lot of train wrecks of people with first-time performances, and it's like, well, I feel like maybe if you were just more prepared that that could have been avoided. That's true. And yep. it's not just about, about being prepared and practicing in front of the mirror in your house if you're a solo artist or practicing by yourself with your headphones on. Yep. Like, you need to have... You know, f even if it's just family and friends, like I would encourage them to obviously be unbiased when they're giving you their criticisms or, or their opinions. Um, but ideally, you definitely want people, you know, give you some sort of input before you put yourself out there like that. Yeah, I, and I mean, that's I guess that's one more bonus about. So if you if you're playing a free gig, um, and and it's like some type of restaurant or some usually it's a, a place that doesn't normally do live music but wants to get into doing it that will offer these kinds of fake opportunities these not really valuable opportunities yeah um, you don't have the kind of grace in one of those venues or one of those types of shows that you will have at an open mic or something like that yeah like. Yeah, the back to the low expectations thing. Yeah, right? the like nice. You, yeah, the nice. You can thing. develop it in an open mic and not feel like, oh, I, because I feel bad if I play a, a crap show. Yeah. And I feel like it's crap, and I feel like people weren't into it. I feel bad, like I, I under delivered on yeah. the product I'm supposed to deliver. You yeah. Know whereas I mean? there's no expectation for quality when you're at an open mic. No, everybody's just there I to mean, play and have fun. Yeah, it's yep. a, it's not really much higher expectation than going to karaoke. Hundred percent. I mean it. It depending. I mean, some open mics you get a lot of really, really good musicians roll through. Yep. I'm not doubting that, but nope. as far as the expectation for them to be good, nada. Yeah, you can have somebody who just started learning guitar this year, and you can have yeah. somebody who's been playing for 20 years. Yeah, I and mean, then they're both on the same ish, le like you, they're regarded the same way until they play. Yeah. Yeah. Like you and I, for for example, you and I actually ran into two two separate uh, artists. I'm not obviously gonna point any fingers. I think it was almost. Almost two gigs in a row. Two separate artists. When they, was this? They, they both they both seemed like they were just slightly unprepared for what had been tossed their way. Was it was this a show or an open mic that we're both talking of about? them were shows. There's a third instance, but we'll, I'll I'll mention that. Right. After. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. The one the one was uh was was someone whose name rhymes with Mamden Fart. All right. And the other would have been at the start of the Rise Up tour, the only show that I played. Right. I re okay, and I so know exactly what you're talking about. Those two people are probably like examples that I would say that you know what, when you when you're showing up and sound sounding that way live, like people don't want to be insulting. No. And like be snickering or like covering their ears like that's the last thing people want to do well no but people will sit there and they'll be polite i'm just like for me personally like if i if i under deliver on a show like if yeah I, I feel bad about it yeah like, 
even even we were on tour in April, there was that one show. Remember, I think we were in Cochrane, and I kind of felt like I didn't play as good as I should have. And and even you and G after said, well, like no, that sounded pretty good. Like everybody seemed to be into it. And yeah. I, just, I felt like I didn't do my best as best as I like. I knew my best, and I felt like I wasn't at that level. Yeah. And I feel bad about that. Like I feel yeah. like I under deliver. Right. And see, see, that's that's a way better attitude to have than to think you did really good. Yeah. And every person in the room was wanting to like stuff cotton balls in their ears. That's you. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, right. Gotta, I'd rather. Have I'd rather have awareness. someone. Yeah. I'd rather have someone who who maybe criti- over criticizes himself a little bit than doesn't criticize themselves nearly enough, and then puts themselves in a position where you know their their music that they're putting out there that's yeah, that's you know a finished product, is you know not overproduced but there's so much electronic involved that it's really hard to tell what that's actually going to sound like live or if it's going to sound, you know, good at all. Yeah. And, and that, in those two instances, I felt like, you know, they were very unprepared for kind of what they've been given. Right. And I feel like first impressions make a huge difference, right? And right. when you're when you're putting yourself out there for the first time, you want to make sure you're prepared for that. Yeah. Because if you're getting a decent audience, especially if you're, you know, maybe opening for gigs, you have some sort of connection with some artist and you, you bomb... That's you definitely don't want that. If that's no. something that could have been prevented, yeah. I mean, if you're having the opener, a screw up is one thing, but being completely unprepared for a yeah. gig is totally different. See, and okay. So, a side note: this is, and that's the next I was going to mention. We were talking about the whole free gig thing. That's the uh, that's what I would say is my example of a gig that you can play for free that is worth the exposure. If you're mm-hmm. opening for an artist who's like a big name artist or something, or I mean, at least like a. A decent amount bigger than yeah, yourself, like like they have know? a following of some sort. Yeah, um, that is, and 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 it's they are the type of artist or they fit in the same sort of genre as you. Yeah, that would be that would be a example of a gig that maybe would potentially be worth playing for free because mm-hmm. the that exposure is concentrated. It's actually yeah, worth as long as you're gonna put on a performance that's actually gonna you know impress people yeah, rather than turn them away because they yeah. they could just as fast go yeah don't don't if you see some this person you don't want to be a bell, artist. Like, at, at that at the end of the show everybody's joking about that opening artist yeah exactly. you don't want to be that guy. no you don't and that's why like i think people really need to be aware and and have people watch them play before they put themselves in a position like that well the sad part is i'm sure everybody's been that artist at one point or another like when you first start out but you want to avoid that especially later in your career if you oh for sure it. but yeah and that, that goes to the whole like people sometimes ask me you know do you get do you still get nervous before you play a show or whatever and I mean, the, the simple answer is yes, kind of, but it's not the same kind of nervousness where you're like, oh, I, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable in front of people. I'm not nervous about that. I'm more nervous about like making sure that everything is delivered well and that the product, again, the show that we're bringing, the entertainment. Yeah, you have a, is, you have a high standard. You yeah, exactly. And and you should. I don't think you should because some people get really confident, and and confidence is good, but it's got to be a balance of that confidence in that you know what you're doing is good and that you are skilled. Yeah. It needs to be realistic and not just like totally overblown. I'm just saying you should never lose that fear. You know what I mean? You should never lose that fear of like playing a bad show. You should work hard to make sure you don't. And I think that's driven by the fear of doing a bad job. Like I never want to do a bad job. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I practice a lot. So, I mean, most of the time I walk into a show with, no, I wouldn't say complete confidence. I mean, anything can go can go awry at any time. Right. But for the most part, as far as my own performance is usually what I worry about. I don't I don't try and focus on what other people are doing. Like most of the time, especially as a drummer, like I play to a click. Yeah. And if I don't, I still like I'll, I'll f- try and focus on yourself, especially as a, for drummers out there. You know, people, the rest of the musicians in the band typically are going to be following you. Yeah. So if you just kind of focus on what you got to do. Don't worry about everyone else. Mm-hmm. Keep your, you know, keep your head down if you're really worried about it. But yeah, yeah but typically sure. I, I go into a show with as soon as I hit hit the stage, like oh yeah, it, goes, it all away. Just goes away. It's, it's yeah. not like it's not like you're constantly chattering your teeth, like no, you know. But but I'm just saying, and and in your case, that fear still applies itself just before you even hit the venue. And Weeks a lot of the time, practice, a lot of right? the time, like, it presents itself as adrenaline more than 
more than fear. Like a rush, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But but what I'm saying yeah. is, is it kind of prevents itself beforehand. Like, it, it's what drives you to practice. Like, oh, I don't yeah. want to mess this show up. Oh, 100%. Right? And so you it, it get, you listen to that song 10 times more in the car on your way over yes. the gig. Yeah, yeah, I do that. I totally do. People, I, I never used to listen. Like, people was like, oh, do you, you know, whatever. I, I would always say, yeah, I don't listen to my own music because then you get sick of it. But um, now I do not like out of pleasure but like if i'm on my way to a gig i'll pop the cd in and i'll mm-hmm. listen to it and i'll be like oh, yeah yeah and kind of like memorize the little rememorize little nuancey parts mm-hmm. that you change on the fly sometimes yeah and it's um and it kind of gets me in the spirit too if i'm like i can kind of feel the song a little before because yeah. I, I feel like a lot of what i do personally is really like it's more emotive it has a little more emotion and and, mm-hmm. and uh rise and fall type stuff in it and and so if i can connect with that a little before a show that really helps me yeah so, um Cool. All right. So I got another question for you. So you, uh, I know you are a big online Facebook arguer. You like to get into some big, online. more like humongous, humongous, <laughs> You're, Logan's humongous, humongous, uh, mundungus. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. So you <laughs> like to argue about this, that, and everything else. And you have particular opinions and you and me share a lot of, uh, particular opinions and beliefs on a lot of things and some things we diverge on, but I guess I want to ask you, um, as somebody who, you know, would identify as more of like a, uh, like a conservative politically in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. how do you, do you feel that that's affected your career in any way? Like, do you feel that, that that has changed the way some people look at you or, or converse with people? I yeah. mean, I mean, even like there's, there's so many simple things that you could take an opinion on that, that your, your average, I mean, it's the, the, I, I don't want to, you know, say leftist, but typically music industry professionals are very liberal. They tend to be very left. Most, meaning. most yep. of them. Right. And so even having just, you know, you know, differing opinions on on fundamental things like uh transgenderism in kids or um you know this this abortion and being pro-life or whatever there's so many different things that like not even just like being like strictly pro-life and being 100 percent against abortion but even would you just, would like, you consider yourself pro-life it's 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 hard to say because i mean i i do i don't necessarily agree with all abortions i definitely think abortion should be you know a last a last resort if ever Mm -hmm. it shouldn't be something that's used as a method of contraception or trying to use it as birth i'm not trying to chat you up i just i've just never heard you say that before so i mean i don't i don't know if i would consider myself pro-life it's just like people trying to consider themselves well it's like people trying to call themselves a feminist right right it's like do you really want to 100 percent of identify with that or because there's certain things that maybe you don't agree with so it's just feels so black and white, right? It's like, yeah. oh, well, are you, are you Democrat or are you Republican? Are you pro-life or are you, or are you pro-choice? You're sure. one or the other. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm not really one or the other. I wouldn't say I'm, I mean, I guess if pro-life means you have to be 100% against abortion, then I'm not. Right. But I think 99% of abortions are probably not the greatest thing. I mean, I feel like most of them should be prevented. I feel like there's other means of, you know, getting around having to make that choice and a lot of people make that choice out of convenience i don't think all people do obviously there's a lot of people that are kind of put in that position maybe you know due to circumstances that were out of their control when it comes to rape and things like that yeah obviously that i feel terrible for that person right there's and i don't know what to tell them like Mm -hmm. it's it's a legal means for them to take care of their you know, problem. Well, it's but. it's an interest like here. It's an interesting thing. Like when it comes to stuff like that specifically, I feel like it's something. So a lot of people have opinions on these things, right? And that's I think I think we are all allowed to have our opinions. And w- a lot of the time, when you come across somebody who has a different opinion than you do, they immediately want to grill you on. Okay, if if that's your stance on this, then what do you do about this? And they want you to have all the answers for everything. Yeah, like you can have an opinion without knowing all the answers to everything and i know and i know i know that sounds kind of like a cop-out but what i'm trying to say is if if you hold the opinion that um you're, you're generally not for abortion mm-hmm. um but if, if for example if you had held the opinion that um 
you, you know, what that, that opinion. And you're like, well, what, what about rape victims and stuff? And you're like, well, I don't know what to tell that person. Then somebody who has the opposite op- opinion of you would be like, oh, well, see, you don't know what you're talking about. And what about yeah. this person? And that's, they'll use that as a justification to. It's like, cause I can never be in that person's shoes. Like no. I physically cannot be a rape victim. That's, that's pregnant with a child. That's from someone who physically pinned me down and forced me to do that. Right. So I can't, I can't empathize them in the same way I could empathize with someone playing their first gig as a drummer. Like right. I know what that person's going through. I'm just There's saying no not way. knowing the answers all the time doesn't necessarily invalidate an opinion or no. a position. Right. No. And I don't think it's very like there are, don't get me wrong. I, I don't think that we should just, I, I don't think it's right to bring up problems and not have solutions. Solutions yeah. are important. But we can't just all have the solutions for everything. If we did, we wouldn't have any problems. So it's obvious that there's problems with all kinds of things out there. And just because you don't know the answer to every single thing, it, it doesn't mean that we should be using that as a club to like. Yeah. Well, that's everybody. why you got to talk about it is because you may not have the answer to it, but someone else might. Yes. So if you ever yeah. talk about these things and never discuss your different, differing opinions, and that's you're kinda, never going to get to an answer. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And that, like, that's kind of like. This bo- this podcast is meant to be a lot of music oriented stuff, somewhat educational and you know interesting, and then a lot of random stuff. And but I I really want it to be conversational, to, so people can kind of hear that like musicians and people that are into the into the scene, they all have they have different opinions. And yeah. I don't I don't want to like force my opinions on people, but I want people to be real and say what they think, right? Yeah. And I don't want this to be something where somebody says something and it's really offensive. Yeah. And everybody's mad at them. Or if you think that just because someone thinks you should think that, you probably shouldn't think that. That's, that's a good, good way of thinking about it. Yeah, I, I would know, agree with that. Think so, what you sh- think. Like, just say what you think. Don't yeah, and examine your beliefs. Else examine you. your opinions. Yeah. Ask yourself, why do I think this? And 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 how does that person feel? And is this acceptable? Like, yeah. like you got to police your own thoughts, for yeah. sure. For sure. And and have a standard for why you logically think things. But yeah. um, that doesn't... And, and once you get to... Like, a lot of people tend to... Once they get to that point, is they tend to be... Um, demeaning to people that hold the opposite opinion. So we just got to keep an open mind and try to talk to people like they're human beings, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes we can pr- we can present things to people that they didn't realize, and sometimes they can do that to us, and that's a good thing. But so getting back to what we were saying before, I guess I just wanted to. So how do you feel that your particular opinions and the way you talk about them has affected you? Like I know you're um, fairly verbal. You like to argue, and it's. Oh, not, yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad thing because I like to argue. I used to really like to argue, and I'm really trying to be careful about it now. Like I don't want to argue as much. I want to converse. I want to have dialogue mm-hmm. like this, but I, I try not to get too involved with I mean, arguing. I get, I get more heated when when people kind of take take things out of context or or put words in my mouth. Right. So um, like recently. I got into a, a bit of a spat with a, uh, a local artist. I'm not going to name names, but um, basically the uh, the core of the argument ended up turning into um, I, I had basically corrected a incorrect stat that was off by a margin of five to ten times. Right. Um, he had quoted that uh, up to something like one percent of the population has some sort of chromosome disorder affecting your genes in regards to your gender. Right. That's not even close to the actual number. It's like 0.01 to 0.02, or sorry, 0.1 to 0.2. He stated it was 1%. No, I think you're a bigot. Cite your sources. <laughs> um, and uh, long story short, he, he basically ended up accusing me of um, uh, being repulsed by transgendered people Be, because wait what does that mean he, being repulsed repulsed like he said i was disgusted by trans people because i think that people that are transgender have a mental illness in the oh, same okay. way that someone with um same way that someone with anorexia you know looks in the mirror and sees someone that's 120 pounds heavier than they actually are mm-hmm. or or someone with dementia that you know sees sees shit like it's it's a matter of something, and, uh, okay. and that doesn't that doesn't okay. make me think lesser of them, and that doesn't make me dislike them or 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 hate them at all. That's just my opinion on what's what's causing their issues. I think that they need help. I think they need mental help, mm-hmm. and I think that. The, the the whole argument around transgenderism and kids and giving kids hormone injections and puberty blockers like un, like 
in in like elementary school like as young as kids at eight years old like, that see and for me that's personally that's where i draw the line like i think be whoever you want to be oh right? yeah i don't i don't judge they can do whatever they want when they're an adult yeah. it's when it's when people are, are are pushing those those ideologies on children that i've heard kids as as young as five years old say they want to grow up to be a fire truck yeah like yeah, like how what, is that? Like any, when, I, when I was four, I was a space cowboy, Spider Man, whatever. Right? How right? is like, that? How yeah. is that any less ridiculous than saying you want to completely change your chromosomes and be the other, the other gender? I mean, it's not like it's physically impossible. It's just hard to commit to a decision being a five year old. Like you can't make a decision well, exactly. that's going to affect you for the rest of your they life. They don't understand what they're saying. No, and, they and don't I, know what that means. The biggest thing is is that um, they're. I, me and Tyson kind of talked about this a bit on the uh, last podcast. Um, when it comes when it comes to kids, like kids can't they don't have the same type of ability to consent and stuff like that. You can't you can't just make those types of decisions for them. Those are decisions that they have to make when they're older, um, and it's not right to take that decision from them. It yeah. seems like uh, like a bit of infringement for me. I don't I don't like sexualizing kids in general. Like yeah. that's that's my biggest concern about it is and I. I I hear the argument. There's sex and gender aren't the same thing. Blah blah blah. But again, okay. So if our kids are kids, can't they just be kids? Like they don't. Why do Why do we have to worry about? Oh yeah, I need to be a female and I need to be a male and I'm I'm whatever. I'm this. I'm that. Like you're just a kid. Go yeah. play outside. Just yeah. be a kid, man. Like yeah, yeah. you know, like play an Xbox. Do whatever kids do. But go like, throw sand. Like yeah, just <laughs> just be a kid. You can be whatever you want. Just be a kid. And then once you're older, you can make decisions those kinds of decisions that are really yeah, going to change like, your what, life. Like, like, like stopping someone's puberty and giving them hormones or blockers to block their testosterone levels. It's going to fundamentally change your brain chemistry. It's going to fundamentally sure. change your body for the rest of your life. And there's absolutely no way to reverse it. Yep. Like, like for, for boys, it prevents their, their private parts from growing. And what that does is it, actually prevents doctors in the future from being able to create a fake vulva if they really wanted to right there's actually not even enough skin there for them to physically be able to do it because there's, the there's body problems. wasn't allowed to grow due to the puberty there's blocks. there's definitely problems there um, not to mention i mean you've seen how crazy like people who even have hormone imbalances yeah in their body just natural hormone imbalances that have to take medication to correct it or take testosterone supplements or whatever it is yeah like that can really mess up your emotions that severe can really depression all kinds of things facial yeah. hair growth in women like there's yep. so much stuff that goes on with that and to think that like you know it all and that like some little kid who's four years old who tells you that he wants to be a girl yeah that that kid actually knows what he's saying and knows that that's actually what he feels and wants like that's totally ridiculous and and, and this is like again if you if you want to raise your if your little kid says i want to wear a dress and you want to let him wear a dress that's I, let I don't, him wear a dress to school I don't and care. then like maybe kids will laugh at him and then he won't want to wear a dress well i, I my point like, is, is i don't care if you want if you want to let your kid wear dresses let him wear i don't care yeah right but you shouldn't like it, it really concerns me when we're talking about injecting things into our children that are going to fundamentally change them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, like wearing a no dress can come it. off if the kid decides he doesn't want to wear a dress anymore. Yeah, exactly. Right, like that's yeah. Maybe he decides, oh, I don't like this dress anymore. Like kids change their mind. Like I change my clothes. To quote yeah. Katy Perry, I had a friend. <laughs> I had a friend. It, was, it just it just reminded me. I had a friend. He he wanted uh, his older sister was babysitting. And he's like, I want spaghetti. So she makes him spaghetti, and then he's like, I don't want spaghetti. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. I want a penis. Yeah. No, you don't want a penis. I don't want a penis. Like, <laughs> like kids, like are so, kids. Okay, so enough soapbox. Like, let's get back. So, you, how do you feel that that uh, arguing and your your opinions and the way that you um, kind of communicate them? How do you feel that that's affected your career? Like, well, you- I guess to cite the specific example of uh, that specific argument, um, the person who I actually had that argument with after he he basically accused me of being repulsed by transgender people at that point i knew the argument was over it's like well this guy's just saying this because my opinions bother him what i think of them is obviously there's nowhere in my thing where i ever stated that you know i have any issue with them at all it's just I, my opinion is yeah, that what is causing I, their thing I will, is I will, that. I will. I do want to point out something though. Is you are an aggressive conversationalist oh, of course. when it comes to arguing things that you're, you feel strongly about. You are. You do have a very um, aggressive tone about you sometimes. So I can I can understand solely based on that how sometimes people would 
because because it draws them in and they want to mm. argue and it makes and you get aggressive and it just escalates and everything gets more heated. So that that is a factor. It's not a not a mean criticism. I'm just <laughs> suggesting that perhaps that's a possibility. Well, I just but. mean like like having an opinion on whether or not someone's mental illness is causing their issues or not does not equate that to you hating them. Like, would you assume that I hate people with dementia because I say that they're mentally ill or would you assume that I hate people with anorexia because I think that they, they have a mental illness? No, no of, you course wouldn't. Not. of course they not. They jump to that because it's a liberal leftist talking point that all conservative people hate transgender people. And I have no issue with them. I want what's best for them. I want them to be able to maybe get some sort of treatment that doesn't involve them cutting off their genitalia and injecting themselves full of chemicals. Right. I want them to get maybe some real mental help and, and find out why they feel that way. Right. Because obviously they, they, they shouldn't feel that way. I so mean, I guess, my, like, so what would be, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a second here. And, and I want to ask you then what would be the, because there are legitimate people who suffer from, um, from uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Gender dysmorphia. Gender dysphoria. Yeah. Dysphoria. Dysmorphia yeah, yeah. or dysphoria. I think it's dysphoria. I think it's dysmorphia. Are you sure? I I could be wrong. I'm <laughs> not a psychologist. But so th- with those people, what what about them? Like, do they? What's the answer for them? Is is a surgery in your in your opinion? Is that ex- like the proper move for them? Or what what do you do about those types of people that? You know, well, they can do whatever they want. Because I, I have no... seen I have seen some studies. Like just just as a side note, I have seen some studies where they. Um, they measure brain activity and brain chemicals and things like that. And they, 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 there are some differences between those people's brains They're They function closer to the gender that they prescribe to be like they, they, I'd like to see those. Cause as far, as far as, uh, the leftist talking points go, they state that there's no difference between the genders. And if there's no difference between the genders and how do you they, tell they do them? like to have their cake and eat it too. Right. For sure. I, if there's I no that. difference between the I, genders. I, how do you know which gender you feel like? I, Okay, so we're getting into a whole sub argument of the whole thing. Of our it's kind of a revel. I mean, yeah. to the, 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 your main question was, has it affected me? And I mean, short answer, yes. So, um, so how is it specifically? Is it... Basically, um, it turns out that another group that I'm that I'm playing that I've mentioned um, is looking at having a CD release this year, and he actually knows one of the members of that's in a band with that guy. Okay, and I he obviously. It'd be difficult to set up a show with someone that you know. Oh, could so you're possibly saying you're, you're losing con- out? You're losing out on people to potentially play shows with because of. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, that's. And it, what else? I Is mean, there anything not, else that you would that, say? I mean, that would obviously be my choice, but I just would rather avoid confrontation. I mean, that's not the sole reason. Like, you, I no, feel okay, like, don't lie. You wouldn't rather avoid. You love confrontation. Otherwise, you wouldn't be no, arguing on I Facebook. I like I like Facebook confrontation. Okay. I don't like confrontation in front of in front of people in public and shit. Like, that's, uh, okay, all that's right. That's different. All right. Um. Um. Well, okay. So let me just frame this for for the people out there that you know see Logan argue on Facebook and stuff. For him, that's a pastime. He enjoys conversation. He enjoys passionate argument. He's not trying to hurt people's feelings or be rude or anything like that. I'm trying to be rude. He is. Sometimes he's trying to be rude. Okay. I'm people, trying to. I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to desensitize people. They need to like not get so butthurt over things. Try to help you out. Okay. So, I, and the reason I ask this is for me personally, like, because I I used to do a lot of really really similar stuff. I used to do really argue a lot with people on Facebook and um, things like that. And I, I try, like I, I try to curb that urge a little more nowadays. And um, cause I like, for me, I've, I've really noticed that there were a lot of people that, you know, no longer wanted to be friends with me and stuff. And I, and I don't think that that's a fair response to having a difference of opinion and arguing even passionately, even if you argue really passionately and, and really disagree and have some fundamental differences, it doesn't, it shouldn't mean that we can't all get along and we can't all be, you know, friends with differences Mm -hmm. and differences of opinion. And I, and I don't think it's fair. I think there, there is a a disproportionate number of people in the industry that lean more left and have different opinions than myself and yourself, for example. And I, I feel sometimes that, there are people out there that, you know, don't want to book me for that reason. Or they, I've had an argument with somebody at one point and they ignore messages or emails from me, things like that. And I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's one, like, I can't prove that. Mm -hmm. I, that's just my experience. That's kind of how I feel sometimes. And I just wanted to see, you know, maybe if you kind of felt similar about that, if that's something that, uh, you know, you felt was kind of 
floating around out there. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been blacklisted by anybody or anything like that, but like, it's just it's just difficult dealing with people when when they're so they can't they can't take an opinion at face value. They have to like equate it to everything else that maybe other like people like ascribe a motive to you. Well, yeah, like yeah. and like maybe other people that share that opinion have other opinions. Right. And now they're ascribing those opinions to you when you never even stated anything like, "Oh, well you believe this, so you must believe that then." Well, why are you assuming that? Right. Why can't you why can't, can't just hold an opinion? Well, yeah. Why can't I hold an opinion on a on a varied amount or, of different or, topics or that ask don't you all... why you hold those opinions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good point. Like why? for instance, that that same person basically jumped down the throat of um, uh, I don't know if I want to drop a name here, but you uh, and. Yeah. Um, he was he was basically in defense of the same thing I was in defense of. And uh, the reason why is because he actually told me he has someone in his family who's actually struggled with getting um, uh, hormone injections and other other things like that at a at a not a crazy young age but you know high school aged person and they say that it's that it's actually demonstrably like like not ruined their life but it's affected their life to the point where like they wish they never did it. I see. And so he holds his opinions because of life experience that he's had personally yeah. dealing with someone in his family who struggled with that. Right. And this person basically told him that he didn't know what he was talking about, assuming that based Just on Just assuming opinion, his motivations, yeah. Based on the opinion that he held that he had no experience dealing with. His it. perspective of... Yeah, you're, people who hold that opinion. Yeah, like you it. only yeah. think this because of trans people because you're a xenophobic piece of shit. It's like, how about no? I actually think that because I have someone in my family who's dealt with it. Right. And the fact that like they assume that is mm. where the problem is. It's not that they maybe think that you think that. It's that they're assuming you think that. You yeah. Know? See, and, and like that's that is important. An important thing to mention is is that you know every. Just because you think that you're the empathetic one, you're the hero of your own story, it doesn't mean other people don't also have their own experiences and their own um, struggles and, and have seen things themselves. And it doesn't mean that they don't have a reason why they feel the way they do about something. So instead of ascribing motive to, to people that, you know, this is why they hold that opinion, thinking they're an awful person because of whatever particular thing, Maybe ask them why they think that. Yeah. And and maybe maybe find out. Maybe you'll learn something new, or maybe you'll figure out how to change their mind to you know reflect what you think is better and and make a better world that way. Uh, okay. So moving on. So you play in a lot of different projects. Yeah. How do you manage to find the time to play in so many different projects? Um. Well, I think minimal jams per week because I play in three different bands. So typically, like I'm I'm only jamming twice twice two to three times a week like right now um hungry hollow is kind of at a bit of a not a hiatus but ian actually ended up taking like a three month thing with um he's doing a like a traveling broadway sort of thing right i heard about that yeah so he's yeah. only really going to be back like every few weeks so so it's not like you have to jam with them every week no i'm jamming with them only like it'll be once a month from like here on out for the next few months yeah. so like it's only two times a week now but before it was it was starting to get a little crazy if i had to like fit in when we were doing some stuff trying to fit in you know yeah we would usually you, do our rehearsals on saturdays right? and yeah trying to fit in the jam with you and then three other people four days a week is a lot that's yeah. that's starting to get to be a lot but three days is i mean it's relatively manageable two two weekdays and a weekend playing that much though you must notice your skill level go up hey eh? it it doesn't go up i've actually found that like i mean it's, it's it's up from before but not as far as like how fast I was improving before, like when I was in high school, I was playing my drums every single day. Right. I had my drums set up in the garage at, at my parents' house. So I would go in there every single day after school from like 16 till I moved out at 20 or 19. Right. And every day I would sit on my kit and play. And that's when you improve the most is when you're playing constantly. And so I found my, my playing improved really fast. And then when I moved out and I wasn't able to play, Except for when I was jamming, my playing kind of plateaued. It stopped. I stopped improving. Right. And um, I kind of started playing in uh, Blasphemedia a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were jamming three times a week. And I found my playing started to improve. And then I stopped playing with them. And I was only jamming once a week. Mm -hmm. And I plateaued again. And now that I'm jamming three times a week and I'm playing with different artists, I find... I'm, I'm not necessarily 
playing faster or better or anything. I'm, I find my consistency is what's getting better. That's probably more important, though. Yeah. Like, just being Consistency more... and being able to uh, keep a constant time through a song without, you know, any speed up or slow down between chorus, verse, all that sort of stuff. Right, right. Without having to completely rely on having a click in your ear. Um, I mean, definitely the more the more time you spend, the, the faster you're going to get better. Um, but three times a week is, at this point, probably, like, my bare minimum. Like, two times a week is actually kind of not even enough Mm -hmm. three times a week is 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 that would be minimum for me for practice Mm -hmm. if i had a choice Mm -hmm. that's a huge time commitment i don't know how you find the time for that but that's impressive um so then with all that in mind like what would you say to somebody who's new and maybe just starting to pick up drums like just what kind of advice well, would you offer them to learn or the most effective way to learn I've, or specific things they should learn? For someone who doesn't want to spend the time or spend spend the money getting lessons to learn how to sight read music. Would you say lessons are a thing that would be worth it? Or what what's it depends it depends what kind of learner you are. I mean, for me personally, I'm an ear learner. Like right. first and foremost, me too. Me I too. learn by by hearing what someone's playing and I learn I learn by watching what someone's playing. Right. So if I can do those two things I can not mimic, but l- like learn exactly what they're doing right. and, and repeat it. Yeah. And so I've found for me the most effective way if I'm, if I'm learning material, if I need to learn a cover song or if I need to learn someone's song that already has drums recorded to it or something like that, I just throw that on repeat and I, I listen to it and I listen to it and I listen to it. And if you have access to being able to play on your kit all the time, I would just say all, pick whatever your favorite artists are that are within your grasp of being able to just sit down and just learn songs. Just, just get on just it. Just play along the music. Just the more you can get on the kit. That's what I started doing. I, st- I basically started on an electric kit, and that was actually really useful because they have a mix-in jack and everything to plug right. your music into it so your drums are actually like in there in your headphones while you're playing to it. Mm-hmm. And the minor things that bother me about an electric kit for someone who's just starting out, that shouldn't really be an issue for them. Right. So I would recommend an electric kit for someone who's just starting out if they're not 100% sure that they're wanting to, you know, dive right in. Yeah. Um, Cost-wise, especially. practice and just listening to a lot of music and trying to learn a lot of music. I mean, start, start slow, right? Baby steps. Like, the first songs I ever learned by year were boulevard of broken dreams by green day and enter sandman by metallica so i mean not exactly the hardest songs right. in my catalog right right but i mean they were easy enough for me to just you know throw them on repeat and what i would do is i'd put them on and every time i'd mess up right restart the song okay so uh with all those different projects you're playing in and stuff do you ever do you see yourself um at any point in the near future just like settling down into one do you see like consolidating your time and really focusing on one? Is that it something? W- it would depend if, if one took off and right. the other two didn't. If something like that happened and, and you know we needed to start touring to support the amount of interest we were getting in the project or something like that, I, you know, I don't know if I would have a choice if I really valued my career in music because the whole goal, right, is to be able to sustain yourself comfortably off, off playing music and and doing that sort of thing so i mean if 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 the stars aligned and i was able to do it i would but um committing to one thing is it's hard it's just a matter of everything sort of sort of lining up so i guess like because your goal probably is just to play as much as possible hey yeah yeah okay so that makes sense so if if you had that opportunity with a single band then possibly but yeah i mean it also depends on you know which band and how passionate i was about the mu- that music particular music at that time because if you're committing right. to one thing and you're playing that all the time it has to be something you really really like yeah i get i get that um and not just like the music and the people but just like like just just the atmosphere you're in and the kind of gigs you're playing and the places you're getting offered to go and all that sort of stuff just everything that kind of come goes along with it mm-hmm. um yeah, I mean, it's if I if I have the time to play more than one project, I'd always want to. Right. It's just a matter of if if I was physically unable to actually make the time commitment and be fair to the other bands. Yeah. Because I don't want to force them to you know want to keep me in the band 
only to have me be touring with some other band two weeks out of every month. Yeah, you know? it seems more common than you think, though, to ha that a lot of people are playing in all these different projects. Like yeah, because it, it seems to be the way that it just has to be. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you can't keep yourself. It seems as busy like as you it's more be. common with like more rhythm musicians than anything I've seen. Like I see a lot yeah. of bass players and drummers that play in multiple yeah. bands because yeah. it's just it's, it's so easy to. I would have to have because you're. I find for guitar and vocals, your sound is kind of your sound. That's true. I th There's I a find lot more drums of a fingerprint and, there. Yeah, yeah, I find drums and bass is a little more adaptable. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, uh, the other thing is too is like again. So if you want to be busy, a lot of people don't have the 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 mustard right in the project right away to be as busy as they want to or play yeah. as much as they want to so they end up getting in a bunch of different projects yeah. and for me i just like i i ended up doing what i'm doing and trying to do it more exclusively uh again i was playing in a rock band and stuff yeah. and, and that as well and i felt like i wasn't devoting the right amount of time to either thing yeah and i like for me at least i wasn't um I wasn't as productive as I should have been in either thing. Yeah. And so I felt like I was just, I was throwing my attention in different places that was not working out for either one. And I yeah. was doing the disservice to both. Yeah. And neither of them were getting the amount of attention you wanted to. Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, yeah, I just, I kind of, it was a self exploration period of time for me where I didn't yeah. really know exactly what kind of stuff I want to do, what I wanted to play, et cetera. And yeah. See, I find so. that would probably be a lot more challenging for someone like you who sings and plays guitar because there's, if you're writing all the all the music too, right? You're writing all the lyrics. You got to devote all. I the was time doing to writing, that in the band too, right? Yeah. You got to write. You got to write two sets of music. You have to write two sets of guitar. You have to write lyrics. You have yeah. to write vocal melodies. Like the whole shebang. Yeah. Me, I'm playing four four in both bands. I don't have to relearn any. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's just so much. So much. Do you write your own? Do you write your own fills and stuff? Or do yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. I pretty much write everything. Um, the only thing is that like, so with Lucid Ending, they had a bunch of like garage band demos where they had programmed drums for. So you kind of copy so that close yeah, as took, you can. Yeah. I took some ideas from it and I kind of improved upon them. Right. So there's some songs where if you go back and listen to the garage band recordings, like there's, there's some unique parts that Steve came up with. I'll give him credit for that. There's right. a couple little parts that I kept cause I was actually pretty impressed with them. So they added some new flavors that I may not have came up with on my own, you know, something that I wasn't totally used to, which is always nice, right? Yeah. It's nice to kind of also get out of your comfort zone and listen to a more eclectic, you know, collection of music and, you know, right. get some ideas that maybe you wouldn't have thought of on your own. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Well, uh, should we call it? We've been here for a while. Yeah. It's, it's probably it's time to get going. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Logan. I really appreciate the yeah, no. uh, the interview no and uh, the, the the time to talk. And w if you have anything you want to specifically plug or mention again, then uh, now's um, the time. Your I would Instagram just say, or... yeah, the the three bands I'm in are uh, Errol Quinn Band, Lucid Ending, and Hungry Hollow. Um, and you just Google those, or how do you? Come yeah, um, hungryhollowband.com for that one, and then um, Errol Quinn. You can find the link through Errol underscore Quinn underscore Band uh, on Instagram. And uh, the Facebook link is actually in the description on Instagram. And then my personal Instagram for my drum channel, which has all the different projects that I'm involved in, is uh, Logan Maxwell underscore drums. There you go. On Instagram. There you go. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time. It's thank been a you. lot of fun. A lot of fun. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks. Cheers.